Committee on Oversight and Government Reform will come to order without objection. The presiding members are authorized to clear a recess at any time. I will now yield uh, to the gentleman from Florida, my friend Mr. Ross, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for today's hearing. The inspectors general conduct investigations and audits to prevent and detect waste, fraud, and mismanagement in their agency's programs. They help Congress shape legislation and to target our oversight and investigative activities. Since their creation 40 years ago, the IGs have proven to be one of Congress's best investments. In the last fiscal year, the IG community used its $2.7 billion budget to identify potential cost savings to taxpayers totaling over $45 billion. That means that for every $1 in the total IG budget, they identified approximately $17 in savings. We have an opportunity today to hear from leaders in the IG community about the inefficiencies throughout the Federal Government, which inefficiencies cost taxpayers money. Specifically, we will discuss findings from a landmark report issued Uh, by the Council of Inspectors Generals on Integrity and Efficiency, also known as SIGI. The report is called Top Management and Performance Challenges Facing Multiple Federal Agencies. SIGI compiled the Federal Government's top performance and management challenges and distilled them down to seven categories. When they did that, some interesting trends emerged. For instance, SIGI found a misallocation of resources and an inability to hire and retain top talent undermined the effectiveness of programs throughout the executive branch. SIGI also found that a lack of performance-based metrics makes it difficult to assess the effectiveness of government programs. But the SIGI report is just a down payment on what will be a larger project to identify the root causes of the challenges we will be discussing today. The burden will then fall to us at the committee level to explore whether there exists any systemic issues that might best be addressed through government-wide policies. That is an issue that is squarely within our committee's jurisdiction, and as we'll hear today, we have our work cut out for us. Today's witnesses and the larger IG community they represent are the people on the front lines of the effort to root out waste, fraud, and abuse throughout the federal government. These three widely respected inspector generals have spent years examining the programs at Justice, Justice Department, the Defense Department, and the National Science Foundation. They also play key roles at the Council for Inspector Generals on integrity and efficiency. SIGI serves a vital role in fostering a relationship between this committee, Congress, and the IG community. SIGI is uniquely positioned to consolidate findings generated by the individual IGs and communicate that information to us, the policymakers. I commend Mr. Horowitz and his colleagues at SIGI for taking the initiative to release this compendium of analysis for the first time. This report is extremely valuable, and I encourage you to continue to be proactive with respect to identifying government-wide trends. I thank the witnesses for appearing today, and I look forward to the, your testimony. I yield back. The gentleman from Florida yields back. The Chair, now recognize the gentleman from Maryland, the ranking member, Mr. Cummings. Good morning. I want to start by congratulating the Inspector General community on the 40th anniversary of the Inspector General Act and the 10-year anniversary of the establishing the Council on Inspectors General for Integrity and Efficiency. In 2008, we here on the Oversight Committee passed the Inspector General Reform Act which was sponsored by Oversight Committee Member Jim Cooper to establish SIGI. One of our witnesses today, Michael Horowitz, serves as the chair of SIGI and has overseen significant changes aimed at making SIGI's and the federal government more accountable and more transparent. One example of the report Siggy released this morning is very important. For the first time, this report provides a comprehensive review of the top challenges currently being faced by federal agencies. The every report exemplifies Siggy's critical mission of examining systemic issues across the federal government. I know my Republican colleagues want to talk about former FBI 
Deputy Director Andrew McCabe, and that's all well and good. But we are now into year two of the Trump administration, and, it's, and at some point, this committee will have to start conducting serious, credible oversight of the Trump administration. For example, CIGI released a report today finding that one of the most serious issues facing CIGI is a culture at agencies that negatively impacts their mission. I've often said that we must always be about the business of effectiveness and efficiency. The CIGI report includes information from 61 different reports issued by IGs in 2017, the first year of the Trump administration. CIGI reported, and I quote, many OIGs report that their agencies face challenges related to their agency's culture, including ethical lapses, lack of accountability, lack of fiscal responsibility, lack of transparency and communication, resistance to change and low morale, end of quote. The IG for the Department of Inspector General reported, and I quote, DOI continues to face challenges holding its employees, including senior officials, to the highest standards of ethical conduct, ensuring the consequences of wrongdoing are clearly understood, taking decisive actions to address unacceptable behavior, and providing relevant ethics training to all employees." End of quote. It's Dr. King who said that so often silence becomes betrayal. Silence becomes betrayal. And apparently there are a number of people who do not want to be silent. And so they want to come to us as whistleblowers in many instances and come to SIGI. And so you do play a very important role. These findings are deeply troubling and they warrant rigorous and sustained oversight from our committee. Unfortunately, our Republican colleagues have blocked every single request we made to an issue subpoenas during the Trump administration, more than 30 in all. For example, the Republicans blocked us from considering a subpoena to the Agriculture Department for documents relating to a senior advisor to the Secretary's communications with the corporate lobbyists. They blocked us from debating and voting on a subpoena for documents relating to allegations of sexual assault and harassment by the Customs and Border Patrol employees. They blocked us from considering subpoenas for documents and testimony related to, to senior advisor to the President Jared Kushner's alleged conflicts of interest and security clearance issues. So during the entire Trump administration, this committee has not issued a single, single subpoena, not one, to any federal agency or any federal official. And that's not because we have suddenly had a massive increase in transparency and cooperation, just the opposite. The Trump administration has withheld documents on dozens of topics from the hurricanes in Puerto Rico and the United States of the Virgin Islands to the first class travel of the President's top aides at taxpayers' expense to the lease for President Trump's hotel in Washington, D.C., just a few blocks from where we sit this morning. The IJs uh, testifying today and staff that support them do great work, work. And let me repeat that. We on this committee believe and know that you all do great work, and we really appreciate it. 
And if there were a time that we need you, we need you now. Um, but they cannot do this work in a vacuum. Congress must fulfill, fulfill its own constitutional duty to conduct oversight of the executive branch. The entire system of oversight must work in order for the federal government to operate effectively and efficiently all the time. And so I hope that today's hearing can be productive and will be a step in the right direction. And Mr. Chairman, I failed to say it, but I want to thank you for holding this hearing. I also want to thank you for your courtesy to me. Uh, because as I went through um, my ailments, uh, you were constantly there for me. Uh, you switched the schedule so that you could accommodate me. Um, you kept me informed of everything. You made sure that I was involved in everything that you did. And for that, I am truly grateful. With that, I yield back. The gentleman from Maryland yields back. Uh, I want to welcome all of our witnesses. I will introduce you as a group and then recognize you um, individually for your opening statements. Uh, first, we are pleased to have the Honorable Michael Horowitz, Chair of the Council of the Inspector General on Integrity and Efficiency and the Inspector General of the United States Department of Justice. The Honorable Allison Lerner, Vice Chair of the Council and Inspector General on Integrity and Efficiency and the Inspector General of the National Science Foundation and the Honorable Glenn Fine, Principal Deputy Inspector General with the United States Department of Defense. Welcome to each of you. Pursuant to committee rules, I'm going to administer an oath. So if you would, please rise and uh, lift your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? May the record reflect all witnesses answered in the affirmative, and they may take their seats. Um, I know um, each of you is an old pro or I should say a pro, um, at this, so you know what the time lights mean. Uh, green, fire away, yellow, get under the light as quick as you can, red, hope you don't see blue lights. So against that backdrop, uh, we will recognize you, Inspector General Horowitz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member <clears throat> Cummings, members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today's important hearing. This year marks the 40th anniversary of, the Congre of Congress's passage of the Inspector General Act. Over those 40 years, the IG community has conducted independent oversight of government programs to root out waste, fraud, and abuse, and to ensure that the organizations we oversee spend tax dollars more effectively and efficiently. In fiscal year 2016 alone, as Congressman Ross indicated, IG has identified about $45 billion in potential savings, a roughly $17 return for every dollar Congress invested in IG budgets. This year also marks the 10-year anniversary since Congress, under this committee's leadership, as Congressman Cummings pointed out, created the Council of the Inspectors General on Integrity and Efficiency, which brought together all 73 federal IGs into one organization. One of the Council's mandates is to address integrity, economy, and effectiveness issues that transcend individual government agencies. The Council is actively pursuing this mandate. At the start of the fiscal year, we launched Oversight.gov, a website where the public can find in one place all publicly issued IG reports in fully searchable formats. And this morning, the Council issued its first ever report on the most frequently cited management and performance challenges facing the federal government as determined by the IG community in their individual top management and performance challenges reports in 2017. The report, which can be found at oversight.gov, identifies seven challenges, which IG Lerner will discuss in more detail during her testimony. Those seven challenges are information, technology, security, and management, performance management and accountability, human capital management, financial management, procurement management, facilities management, and grant management. A number of other extremely important challenges, such as national security, public safety, and public health, are not included in the list, primarily because only a limited number of IGs have oversight responsibility in those areas. Their absence certainly does not reflect a qualitative judgment about the imp impact or importance of those challenges. 
Rather, we believe the Council's effort to identify the most common government-wide challenges will inform the public and policymakers in the executive and legislative branches by identifying broad categories of challenges shared by the majority of federal agencies, notwithstanding vast differences in their sizes and missions. They will also help the IG community as we plan our oversight work going forward. The Council and the IG community looks forward to undertaking, the additional, important, to undertaking additional important initiatives on behalf of the public we serve. As the public's watchdogs, we will not waver from our 40-year commitment to strong and independent oversight that helps promote effective and efficient government. Thank you again for this committee's strong bipartisan support for our community, and I look forward to answering any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Inspector General. Inspector General Lerner. Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me today to discuss the top government-wide management and performance challenges identified by the IG community. Our report focuses on the top seven challenges most frequently reported by 61 statutory IGs in 2017. <coughs> I'll briefly discuss each challenge. First, information technology security and management is a serious long-standing challenge. Agencies need reliable and secure IT systems to perform their mission criti critical functions. Yet across government, we identified problems in key areas, including the protection of sensitive data and information systems from cyber attacks, modernizing and managing IT systems, ensuring continuity of operations, and recruiting and retaining a highly skilled cybersecurity workforce. Resource constraints and a shortage of cybersecurity professionals contribute to these challenges. The second most reported challenge was performance management and accountability. Although federal agencies vary greatly in size and mission, they face common challenges in, in improving performance in agency programs and operations. The key areas of concern we identified included collecting and using performance-based metrics, overseeing private sector products or services that, it could that could affect human health, safety, or the economy, and aligning agency operations to agency-wide goals. Third, human capital management is a significant challenge that affects the ability of federal agencies to meet their performance goals and, e and efficiently carry out their missions. We identified key challenges, including inadequate funding and staffing, problems recruiting, training, and retaining qualified staff, agency cultures that negatively affect the agency's mission, and a lack of succession planning. The fourth most reported challenge was financial management, which covers a broad range of functions such as, such as program planning, budgeting, accounting, audit, and evaluation. Weaknesses in any of these issues limit an agency's ability to ensure that taxpayer funds are being used efficiently and effectively. To mitigate risks to federal programs and operations, agencies need to improve their financial reporting and systems and to prevent and reduce improper payments. Estimates of improper payments totaled about $141 billion in FY 2017. The fifth challenge, procurement management, encompasses the entire procurement process from pre-award planning to post-award contract administration. In FY 2017, the federal government awarded more than 50 $500 billion in contracts. Many federal agencies rely heavily on contractors to perform their missions. As a result, weaknesses in procurement planning, oversight of contractors' performance, and staff training place potentially billions of taxpayer dollars at risk. The sixth most reported challenge was facilities maintenance. Agencies face challenges ensuring that their facilities stay in proper condition <clears throat> and remain capable of fulfilling the government's needs. IGs have identified insufficient funding as the primary reason why agencies fail to maintain and improve their equipment and infrastructure. The key areas of concern we identified include the, included the increased likelihood of mission failure and the higher overall cost of deferred maintenance. The seventh and final challenge, grant management, involves the process used by federal agencies to award, monitor, and measure the success of grants. Deficiencies in any of these areas can lead to misspent funds and ineffective programs. In FY 2018, federal agencies are expected to spend more than $700 billion through grants to state and local governments, colleges and universities, and, communi and community organizations, among others. The key areas of concerns we identified include ensuring grant investments achieve intended results, 
overseeing the use of grant funds, and obtaining timely and accurate financial and performance information from grantees. While we couldn't make conclusive determinations with respect to the underlying causes of these challenges, the report notes that many were affected by resource issues, both human and budgetary, and by federal agencies' failure to use performance-based metrics to assess the success of their programs and operations. By consolidating these challenges, we hope to help policymakers determine how best to address them in the future. This concludes my prepared statement. Thank you again for your, the strong support of our community's work, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Madam Inspector General. Uh, Inspector General Fine. Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to appear before you today, along with my IG colleagues, to discuss our top management challenges. We all appreciate the committee's longstanding support for and interest in the important work of IGs. The DOD OIG's annual report on the DOD's top management challenges is a critical tool that we use to perform our important oversight mission, which is to detect and deter waste, fraud, and abuse in DOD programs and operations, to promote the economy, efficiency, and effectiveness of the DOD and to help ensure ethical conduct throughout the DOD. That is a significant challenge, given the size, complexity, and importance of DOD operations. Our annual top management challenges reports helps us to perform our mission. Preparing our report is a team effort that draws upon the expertise and judgment of many individuals throughout our organization, some of whom are here today. We identify the challenges based on a variety of factors, including OIG oversight work, oversight conducted by other DOD components, GAO and other IG reports, congressional testimony, and other important documents. We also seek input from DOD leaders on what they consider to be the top challenges they face, but we identify our top challenges independently based on our own judgment. We do not simply draft this document as a paper or compliance exercise. Rather, we use our report to identify key areas of risk in the DOD and to decide where to allocate our oversight resources. We also try to ensure that each DOD top challenge receives some oversight coverage, and we therefore link our annual oversight plan to the top DOD challenges. In addition, we provide our report to new leaders when they arrive at the DOD. We believe it provides them a useful summary on risk areas, and we have received many positive responses from them on the report's value. I want to now turn to the top DOD challenges that we identified for fiscal year 2018. One countering strategic challenges from North Korea, Russia, China, Iran, and transnational terrorism. Two, addressing challenges in overseas contingency operations in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. Three, enabling effective acquisition and contract management. Four, increasing cybersecurity and cyber capabilities. Five, improving DOD financial management. Six, maintaining the nuclear enterprise. Seven, optimally balancing readiness, modernization, and force structure. Eight, ensuring ethical conduct. Nine, providing effective, comprehensive, and cost-effective health care. Ten, identifying and implementing efficiencies in the DOD. Some on our list of top DOD challenges overlap with SIGI's list. For example, the SIGI report identifies financial management as a challenge, as do we. The DOD is undergoing a full financial statement audit for the first time this year. Inaccurate or incomplete DOD financial statements impairs the DOD's ability to provide reliable, timely, and useful financial information to support operating, budgeting, and policy decisions. The SIGI report also identifies procurement management as a cross-cutting challenge facing federal agencies. We do also. For the DOD, delivering weapons and technology systems on time and within budget continues to pose major management challenges. Some DOD challenges do not overlap with SIGI's list. For example, addressing challenges in overseas contingency operations is a key challenge for the DOD. The DOD IG is currently designated as the lead IG for three overseas contingency operations, Operation Inherent Resolve, that effort to degrade and defeat ISIS in Iraq and Syria, Operation Freedom Sentinel, the effort to build partner capacity within the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces and to counter terrorism in Afghanistan, and Operation Pacific Eagle, the effort to support the Philippines' fight against ISIS and other extremist groups. Another DOD challenge, which is not unique to the DOD, is ensuring ethical conduct. Any ethical failures by DOD officials can undermine public confidence in the DOD. 
At its core, ethical misconduct violates DOD core values and the high standards of, ex of integrity expected of DOD personnel. Therefore, DOD leaders continually strive to deter and prevent ethical lapses and misconduct and hold accountable those individuals who violate the law or other ethical requirements. Finally, we are now in the process of reassessing the DOD's top management challenges for fiscal year 2019. We'll, we fully expect that certain challenges will remain and we will continue to assess emerging challenges to make our report forward-looking. In closing, I want to thank the committee again for your support, for holding this hearing, and for asking me to discuss the DOD's top management challenges. That concludes my statement, and I would be glad to answer any questions. Well, thank all of you, and thank you for meeting um, one of uh, Congress's benchmarks. Um, you got all of your openings in within the five-minute time period. With that, the gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized, Mr. Russell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> and thank all of you uh, just for the great work that you do. Um, I, I guess uh, I'll have questions uh, that any of you can answer, uh, but I know some of it will be specific to your particular areas. Um, one of the big things that you've identified in your reports is the $141 billion over nine agencies in improper payments. Uh, I mean, this seems like low-hanging fruit, <clears throat> and yet that is a, an enormous dollar amount when we think about it. And oftentimes, as we're looking to, you know, not balance the budget each year, uh, this is something that would make a significant headway in that. Uh, and so what, how do we get at that? I mean, we, we identify it, we know it, uh, we've identified the dollar amounts, we know the nine agency offenders, how do we stop it? Let me um, tell you some of the challenges we faced at DOJ, OIG, and I think my colleagues have faced as well, which is um, in an era of big data, what we're learning, as many of us are doing data analytics work to try and get at those issues, is our agencies don't keep good data or no data at all. As an example, we went to see about healthcare fraud questions at the Justice Department. Justice Department spends over a billion dollars a year on inmate healthcare. Um, we went to the 121 or so institutions to get their electronic medical records to see, look for anomalies um, in payment patterns, and we learned that about 100 of those 121 actually still have paper records. Um, and so we issued a report to the department, it's public, uh, expressing our concern about that. Um, and they have issued now a request to seek to turn all of those into electronic records. But those are challenges we're seeing over and over again. Um, and the government needs good data. The committee is to be recognized for passing the Data Act, which hopefully moves us towards better data. Right. Hopefully so they can pay issue. for it with the recoup of who they're not improperly paying rather than asking for additional appropriation. Yeah. yeah, if I could add, I agree with that. I agree with uh, uh, Michael Horowitz's comments. I think there are sort of three things that need to be done. One, there has to be adequate internal controls so that the money doesn't go out the door inappropriately. We've seen that in healthcare and DOD, right. compounding pharmacy money, billions of dollars going out because there's not good internal controls. Two, when we find that, there people ought to be held accountable for this. So there needs to be some deterrent. It just doesn't move on. And the third thing is data analytics. We need to do a better job and more have more capacity to analyze the massive amounts of data within the DOD and the entire federal government to root out indicators of fraud to provide the leads that we can go after. Yeah. Ms. Lerner. I, I would just make one final point. A lot of the improper payment work that OIG, OIGs do is driven by risk assessments that agencies are, are supposed to perform. And I think sometimes you need a culture change within the agency for it to be acceptable for them to acknowledge that risk exists, because without that, the quality of the risk assessment isn't going to be strong. And without a strong risk assessment, your ability to identify and fight those improper payments is undermined. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, with my remaining time, I'll just hit the last three areas and whoever wants to comment on it. Uh, a payment to grantee verification. This is another big thing that I know all of you are concerned about. With $700 billion of grants issued each year, uh, this is an enormous amount of, our, of, of the uh, American people's working capital that is sent to Washington, and yet oft times we have problems of knowing who's identifying the grants. And then you stood up the Disaster Assistance Working Group on your own initiative, which I applaud you for, because we appropriated $26.1 billion uh, that went out in disaster assistance. Obviously, all the hurricanes, fires, and floods, only the United States could weather 
something so enormous. Uh, but I'm glad that, that you uh, stood that up for that oversight. And then the last item is the overseas contingencies in Afghanistan, Syria, and Asia. You know, oftentimes uh, we've joked Afghanistan is the biggest black hole of waste in the Department of Defense. And so those are the three other areas, if, if any of you care to comment. Sorry, in terms of grant expenditures, we're, again, I'll, I'll repeat what Mr. Fine said, analytics, analytics, analytics. It helps us when grant funds are, funds are expended. It would be wonderful to be able to, in situations where there are disasters, to have them set up so that we can catch things even earlier. Let me just touch on the disaster assistance working group issue. It is something that's very important to us. One of the things that we're trying to do in DHS, OIG, is the lead on that. Um, work closely with GAO so that we're coordinated with each other as well as state and local oversight entities. There are state auditors, there are state IGs involved in some of the uh, hurricane relief locations. We want to make sure we're well coordinated with each other. Um, we want to share information. Um, we don't want to duplicate effort and that's one of the things I know we've all been doing, SIGI IGs with GAO um, to make sure we're coordinated on our oversight. But one of the things we've also done, I just want to mention in connection with oversight.gov, try to replicate what the IG community did with the Recovery Act funds in 2009, which is create a page on the oversight.gov website so the public can see what we're finding and what we're seeing. One of the issues we've come to Congress for in FY18, and we didn't get funding, but we're looking for in FY19, is a very modest amount of money, one to two million dollars, to build out oversight.gov, and that's one of the things we'd like to build out further, is that web page. And so while Congress appropriated the 26 plus billion dollars, what we're looking for is uh, some additional funds to, to allow the transparency to occur around that spending. Uh, if I could address the overseas contingency operation issue, yes, Afghanistan is a source of a lot of money and a lot of waste. And we, both we and the special IG for Afghanistan reconstruction have issued reports on that. There needs to be better internal controls. There needs to be consequences for the waste when it's, when it's exposed. There are bilateral financial commitment letters that are signed, but they often don't have any consequences and are often waived. I was there recently and met with the commanders, the, um, the diplomatic personnel, as well as Afghan officials, including President Ghani. They seem committed to internal controls and reform, but it's too early to say whether it will have any impact. There is a massive amount of money that goes there, and a lot of it is wasted. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Oklahoma yields back. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just following up on Mr. Parmer's questions, <clears throat> I can notice that you all keep saying waste, waste, waste. I mean, uh, do you think any of it is fraud, Mr. Fine? I, I didn't know whether you were limiting it to waste. No, I'm not. Absolutely. Waste, fraud, and abuse. Okay. It's all of that. And there are a lot of cases that we make, criminal cases, to hold people accountable for fraud. Sure, what's the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act of 2012 requires all federal agency uh, non-disclosure policies, forms, and agreements to include specific language making clear that the policy or the agreement does not impact statutory protections that allow federal employees to communicate with Congress and IG, IGs. Are you familiar with the requirement? I am. On January 29, 2018, Attorney General Sessions issued a memorandum <clears throat> to the heads of all departments of justice components and all U.S. attorneys titled Communications with Congress. Are you familiar with that memo? I am. <clears throat> the memo directed department employees that communications between the department and Congress must be managed through the Office of Legislative Affairs. The memo said, and I quote, attorneys, officers, boards, divisions, and components should not communicate with senators, representatives, congressional committees, or congressional uh, staff without advance coordination and consultation with OLA, end of quote. Attorney General Sessions uh, did, did not include in his memo the language required by the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act that says these words. These provisions are consistent with and do not supersede 
conflict with or otherwise alter the employee's obligations, rights, or liabilities created by existing statute or executive order relating to classified information, communications to Congress, uh, the reporting uh, to an <clears throat> Inspector General of a violation of any law, rule, regulation, or uh, mismanagement, a gross waste of funds, and abuse of authority, or a substantial and specific danger to public health or safety, or any other whistleblower protection, end of quote. Do you believe that the language was required to be included, that language, in the Attorney General's memo? Uh, Congressman, I think it's very important that all employees understand their rights under the whistleblower laws for the reasons you indicated. We've been in touch with the Department about <coughs> the issue, and it's certainly my hope that that will be clarified and may made clear. What, what was the, the response so far? Well, I'd, I'd rather not get into the back and forth that we might have had intern that we've had internally, but um, it's certainly my hope that uh, there will be a, um, a clarification of that. Because what happens, as you can imagine, if people feel reluctant to, <clears throat> to communicate with their representatives, we can't do our job. You can't either, right? Yeah, that's, you know, whistleblowers play a very important role. This committee has seen it um, over and over again. We could go through many of the examples of that. So it's very important that employees know if they see something going wrong, they have avenues to go to the IGs and in appropriate circumstances, Congress. Now, Senator Grassley wrote to the Attorney General on February 5th, 2018, uh, raising concerns with the memo's failure to comply with the law. To your knowledge, has DOJ taken any actions to uh, correct this violation and ensure all employees know their rights to communicate with Congress and IGs. I know what you just said, but has anything been done? I haven't seen anything further um, at this point, but uh, we're certainly um, aware of the issue, and like I said, we've been in communication with now, the Now, DOJ is not the only agency that has issued a policy on communications with Congress that violates the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act. Now, the IG for the General Services Administration issued a report March 8, 2018, and found, and I quote, GSA policies regarding communications with Congress operate as non-disclosure policies under the WPEA, but do not include the WPEA's uh, whistleblower protections language. Are you concerned that this could be <clears throat> a, w a wider problem? Um, I'm not, as I sit here, familiar with sort of what the other uh, agencies are doing, but as I said earlier, I think it's very important for IGs to be able to get information uh, from whistleblowers, and I completely understand as well from the WPEA how important it is for, con and from just experience, how important it is for Congress to be an avenue of reporting for individuals who want to come forward and report waste, fraud, and abuse. As I close, do you consider this a top priority? Uh, for me, it's a top priority. I mean, and for your organization, you're the top man now, right? You still, you still. I don't know if I'm the top man, but. Uh, <laughs> Not, uh, I mean, but, for your organization. I mean, this. I think this goes to the essence of e the chairman talks about it. I've talked about it. You talked about it being effective and efficient. I just, I just want to know. I don't want any member of Congress uh, to be cut off from information or you yep. that you need to do your job. This, I mean, why are we going to waste money, spend money on an agency that can't even get the information that they need to do their job? So I, I just want, all I'm asking is, I'm not asking, I'm begging you to make this a top priority for your, your organization. I think we need to look and see whether other uh, agencies are doing this kind of thing, and we need to address that. Look, it, it's absolutely whistleblower protection is a top priority for me, for my office. The work we've done in that area is very significant. In fact, one of the reasons we've asked for an, an additional uh, six positions this year in our budget request to Congress and wrote a letter to the Congress about our concern uh, on this issue is we're seeing a very significant increase in the FBI whistleblower retaliation cases that are coming to us that, as you know, by regulation go to our office, not the special counsel's office. And that is a very substantial increase over the last seven, eight years. It's not in the last year. We're talking about a growth over time, six, seven years. Um, requires us to meet certain timelines that are in the law. And if we don't get that, those additional positions, it's going to crowd out some of the other work we're doing. So um, we think it's a very important area 
We think whistleblowers are the lifeblood of IGs, of the work we do. We've got to take steps to ensure that they understand they can come forward, report to the IGs, to Congress, um, and not be retaliated against, not be subject to threats, because it takes extraordinary courage to step forward and report out on waste, fraud, and abuse in your organization. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. The gentleman from Maryland yields back. The gentleman from Alabama is recognized. Thank the chairman. Um, on the improper payments, um, they've been identified as a key concern, as the gentleman from Oklahoma brought up. Mr. Fine, your recent Department of Defense uh, up here, a compliance report noted that the department did not comply with five of the six recommendations. Uh, when was the last time DOD was in full compliance? That's what I thought. Uh, due to noncompliance with IPERA, DOD is required to issue a report describing actions the agency will take to come into compliance. Uh, have they issued that report? <clears throat> In the FY 2016 report, your office made Mr. Fine, could you turn your microphone on? Sorry. Thank you. I think he answered no to both questions for the record. Uh, that they have not issued, they have not complied, and they have not issued a report explaining um, actions that they will take to comply. In the uh, FY 2016 report, your office made a number of recommendations that DOD agreed with. Have any of those recommendations been fully implemented and you know, closed? I, I have to go back and look and see whether that's the case. I, I wouldn't doubt it, uh, but uh, we, are, we, we are in the process, and we currently do that. We look to make sure that the recommendations that we make and they agreed to are actually implemented, and we have actually issued a report recently, compendium of open recommendations. There's more than 1,200 open recommendations. Is this a report? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter this into the record. Without objection. Okay. Um, I understand the Department of Defense is initiating an audit, which is obviously long overdue. Uh, would you agree that that will, will help? And, uh, Identifying the improper payments and financial statement audit. Yes. Yes, absolutely. It's a very important audit. It's critical. Okay. Let me uh, transition here uh, quickly to uh, Mr. Horowitz. Uh, in your statement, you said in 2016 the IGs identified approximately 45.1 million in savings. How much of that has been realized, or, or do you know? Um, I don't know. As I sit here today, how much has been realized? I think one of the things that we'd like to see. I know we're doing this within our own organizations, trying to figure out how we can follow up on those numbers within the Justice Department. That, um, that was what I was going to ask you. Is there any way to determine whether or not, I mean, we identify them, that makes them potential. Right. If they're actually realized, then, then that makes them obviously real savings. And I, I just wonder if there's a way to make sure that when we identify it, that someone follows up on it and we are able to to realize those savings. Yeah. And, and we follow up on all our recommendations, and they don't get closed until we decide to close them. Um, what we need to do more work on with the agency is to get reports on what kind of recoveries there are. We're starting to do that, and we've been putting out uh, announcements, releases to the public to let them know when we have had recoveries. I want to uh, also stay with you just for a moment, and, and Ms. Lerner, you can respond as well if you'd like. But when we're talking about the disaster relief funds, uh, there, uh, I, think, I believe there's several billion in unspent totals from Sandy. There's unaccounted for funds from Hurricane Matthew. Um, we know that prior to the disaster relief funds being uh, uh, approved for Puerto Rico, they paid out $100 million in bonuses. Um, you identified $26.1 billion in disaster relief funds. Those were community development uh, block grants. And my concern about, about this is, is, is there's no way to really manage these funds to determine that the money's actually getting where it needs to go. If this were a private contract, you would award money on the front end to meet the immediate need, and then everything else would be paid the invoice. Does that make sense? It's been a, a significant concern of, I think, all of the IGs that are looking at their agencies which put out money uh, through grants, contracts, and others is the lack of performance management and accountability that's going on there and, and understanding uh, at the end of the project what the successes were, what the failures were, after action plans. I mean, you do all of that um, after spending a substantial amount of money. And one of the things we've also seen in, at DOJ OIG, and we uh, just uh, issued a report on and we've done in the past, is 
on unspent grant funds and closing out grants in a timely fashion. Um, and because that money is just sitting there and can be misused. And so that's very important. Mr. Chairman, I, I want to further explore the, the grant issue. So if um, I think what I'd like to do is let everyone else ask their questions and then come back to this um, afterwards, if that's okay. Um, sure, I'll consult with my uh, ranking member and uh, or else uh, one of uh, your colleagues, including me, may actually yield you some time. So you can finish that line. Uh, right now or afterwards? Well, it's not my turn right now, but when it is my turn, um, I will uh, I will give you some of my time, assuming uh, Inspector General Horowitz answers my questions as quickly as he normally does. You're a very <laughs> generous chairman, and I. Uh, and you're a very diligent member, and I appreciate your uh, your interest. Uh, with back. that, the gentleman from Alabama yields back, and the chair will recognize the general lady from the District of Columbia. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Lerner, I have a question about the report that Siggy issued this morning. Um, this notion of draining the swamp seems to be turned on its head because we have had more uh, virtual explosion of scandals uh, and ethical lapses during this uh, administration, young as it is. In fact, it's the most I can remember, so in recent memory they seem to be outnumber the, the explosions that come from year to year in prior administrations of both parties. So I'd like to ask about the, the culture of, of, of agencies uh, that is mentioned in the report. And here I'm quoting uh, the report issued today that the OIGs reported their agencies face it challenges related to the agency's culture. I'm trying to find out whether the Congress or, or the IGs can do something about this culture. And cited were ethical lapses, lack of accountability, lack of fiscal responsibility, lack of transparency and communication, resistance to change, and low morale. That is as comprehensive an indictment of agencies as I can remember hearing as a member of the, this committee. Uh, so uh, uh, I take it we're talking about a systemic problem covering, what is it, uh, two or three agencies more across the board? What do we mean by the culture that has set in? It's unclear to me the precise number of agencies that are experiencing those problems, but it's clear that this is, it's not a handful. Um, and, and it is incumbent then on us as IGs to be, to have our eyes open, to catch these issues, to audit and investigate when necessary. Well, one, one wonders, you know, the, these are agency heads who ultimately have to be held accountable. And so one wonders whether anyone is advising them, whether IGs ahead of time, whether they ask for uh, information. I can tell you that, low, <laughs> that staff members in their 20s, if I uh, ask them to do something, they'll say to me, Congresswoman, is this, uh, is, it, it, do you want me to check? I mean, they are sensitive to this, um, to trying to keep me from, you know, catch me before I kill from getting in, in trouble. Who catches the agency head before the agency head kills, or is this just willful? A determination, as with, with Administrator Pruitt, who may be in the worst trouble and have had the most lapses, uh, the notion of installing a, um, class, a classified phone, phone book booth for $43,000, somebody <laughs> should have tapped him on the shoulder. Is there any way before that phone booth goes up <laughs> to catch him before he spends $43,000, not to mention uh, all of his other lapses uh, for which he has yet to be held accountable? Or is this all after the fact and taxpayers have to say, well, nobody's in charge, uh, nobody's going to jail, and nobody's suggesting jail, so what can we do? I think we hope that the, the general counsel's office and the ethics officials provide the right advice to folks. Well, who and is it? Are, are, are the agency heads know that there is somebody they should ask? I, I did Mr. Pruitt understand? Who did he ask they, before they, installing 
a, a soundproof phone booth. I can tell you who they should ask. They should ask their de designated agency ethics official and their, their attorneys have who deal with ha appropriations. Ha have law. any of you, Mr. Horowitz, Ms. Lerner, have, uh, have any of you issued, some, seeing how systemic this is, have you issued anything to the agent saying, we advise that before you undertake any, age, any, any action which has not been taken before in your agency, that you inquire of and you name who to inquire. I would imagine, and I'll let our, my colleagues answer too, but that's one of the first topics of conversations with new agency leadership that come on board. Have you done it with agency heads of this administration? Uh, we do not have an agency head from this administration at no, my for, agency. For, for, for the <laughs> agency heads for this administration. Um, we have Mr. Horowitz? Yeah, we, we have not had some of those kinds of issues um, in my agency with regard to, um, you know, the phone booths and that sort of thing. So I can't speak to what has gone on there, but the first, one of the first things we do is meet with the Attorney General, same, I've now served under three Attorneys General as IG, and done that in each instance. Sit with them, tell them, remind them of what we do. In each case, all three Attorneys General grew up in the Justice Department, so they understood what my office was, but they still needed to hear um, what we do, what kind of reports we expect. And I agree with what IG Lerner said. The understanding is that they need to go to their, the agency ethics official, they need to go to their counsel, and we need to be, as IGs, uh, diligent in overseeing any wrongdoing that occurs and making sure that People not only understand the rules, but if there are violations of the rules, as my fellow IGs indicated, hold people accountable, make sure the public understands and the people in the agency understand that even the most senior officials are held accountable for misconduct. We do that through posting the summaries of our work. Um, and that, I think, is very critical to the deterrent message as well. My time I, has I, expired. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, would you would you agree to let him, him, him the Mr. Fine response? He seems to want to respond. Yeah, I, I agree with that. We, that's what we try and do too. I, for example, meet with each with capstone classes, which are new admirals and generals, to talk about what will get them in trouble, what they should avoid, what they need to do to consult with their lawyer. I met with the heads of the agency uh, as soon as they come in to talk about that. The tone gets set at the top, and it's very important for us to have that communication with them. I've been very fortunate myself. Uh, the Secretary of Defense has made clear about the need for ethics and has made clear the need for cooperation with the OIG and made clear the need for people to be held accountable when they have ethical lapses. So that is very important and we need to be on the front end in terms of education as well as also on the back end when there are lapses and there will be lapses, we need to hold people accountable. Mr. Chairman, can I mention just one other thing that we do as IGs? We also issue advisory memos. We each call them something different, but if we see a problem along the way, we issue a management advisory memo to alert leadership to a problem we're seeing so they can fix it systemically and avoid and address those kind of issues. As an example, within the last year, we identified substantial issues in a variety of ways through our work about sexual harassment policies at the department. We issued a management advisory memo that got some publicity um, in the press about that. But that was an important thing to identify early on to leadership, what we were seeing so they could take action. I, th I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could I just ask that in light of the um, systemic uh, issues that have been identified, that the uh, committee look for ways to be more proactive, even with all that has been testified here. We still have this uh, plethora of scandals arising and perhaps uh, more proactive action than has been testified uh, would, uh, would, would be called for at this time. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from the District of Columbia yields back. The chair will now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Judge Duncan. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And first of all, I want to say how much I appreciate the work of the various inspectors general uh, throughout our government. I'm, I'm now uh, completing my 30th year in the Congress, and, and not all of that time has been on this committee, but probably two-thirds of it has. And, and this committee over those years has become really the main investigatory committee in the Congress, and we couldn't have done, or we couldn't have been nearly as effective 
in our work on this committee had it not been for the um, information provided to us by the various inspectors general. I, over the years, I've passed four bills or, uh, or introduced four bills that have gone through this committee and through the Congress. Probably the easiest or the least controversial was the bill to create an inspector general for the Tennessee Valley Authority, which I'm, uh, uh, while I say it was uh, easy, that doesn't uh, denigrate or uh, doesn't mean it wasn't uh, important. But um, I think back over the years about all the different investigations that have been brought to light. I remember my shock at the at finding that the FBI had kept a, a man in federal prison for 30 years for a murder that they knew he did not commit because it was going to disclose uh, um, some vital information about the Whitey Bulger case, which was one of the biggest uh, cases in the country at one time. And, and I remember thinking, I still think it's one of the worst things I've ever heard about. And, and uh, I think back about the, uh, the findings at the EPA where they had a man who uh, uh, didn't go to work for a couple of years but drew a, a high salary and, and all these different things. So, uh, and I'm, I look, I, I was given uh, here this morning an article that from a few days ago about um, uh, the waste uh, in the Pentagon and, and um, uh, the, 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 that the Pentagon could not justify the spending in Afghanistan. I, I heard Mr. Russell say that uh, it's a sort of a joke about the, um, um, how much waste there's been over, on the spending over there. and I. Um, I don't think, uh, I, I really don't think it's much of a joke, and I, I, I'm glad that the, uh, uh, the inspectors general have taken it to, to heart and have, have brought forth a lot of uh, this information. And, and I, I was also given an article about the, um, this University of Pittsburgh pr professor that got uh, $50 million uh, in the last 20 years from the National Science Foundation in 24 different uh, grants and how the inspectors uh, that um, Ms. Lerner's office is starting to uncover some scandalous uh, uh, information about uh, some of these grants. So, so I uh, commend you I, um, in that regard. And, and uh, Mr. Fine, I, I wasn't really clear. Do you think uh, th this, this article I've got, it says uh, the, the, um, uh, the Pentagon, the Department of Defense Inspector General, uh, cannot account for 3.1 billion of spending that's been done uh, over in Afghanistan in the latest investigation. Do you, do you think that uh, we're going to continue to see things like that or are we getting closer to getting things a little bit under control? We're spending it, this article says 45 billion a year over there and that's, that's an awful lot of money. It is a lot of money. That's the article you're referring to uh, refers to one of our summary reports, which talks about all the reports we've had over the years to talk about how they could not account for fuel and ammunition or payment for soldiers, and they did not have adequate internal controls, and they did not enforce uh, commitment letters when the, when the Afghans could not account for the money. So I do think uh, it is a significant amount of money. I think in a deployed environment, it is, it is more difficult than here in the United States, but that doesn't mean that we should not provide oversight and internal controls and ensure that the money is being used for its proper purposes. I know the Department of Defense is concerned about it and is committed to this. As I mentioned, I was over in Afghanistan, and there are sort of roadmaps and, and commitments, but commitments are easy to do. It's important to make sure that, that they actually happen. And so I, I believe that we will continue to see problems, but um, we need to continue to stay on top of that. Ms. Ms. Lerner, uh, uh, you know, there's too many things in the federal government that are sweetheart insider deals. And, uh, and I do hope that you're looking more closely at people who are getting repeated grants, like this University of Pittsburgh professor that got $50 million over from 24 different grants. Well, he apparently had some really good connection there at the National Science Foundation. So. Do you look a little closer at some of those who are getting uh, the most grants or the, the most money? We have a risk ma matrix that we're constantly updating as we learn um, 
and are exposed to new and different ways that people try to misuse NSF funding. So I think we've gotten pretty darn good at, at targeting er areas of risk, um, but we, we know we can always get better, and so we take in, and we add to that risk matrix on an ongoing basis. Well, we've got so many good scientists in this country that, exactly. that these grants should be spread out. They shouldn't just be given to a, a small, tiny group of favored individuals. My time's up, but I really do appreciate all the work that the inspectors general have done for this committee over the years. Thank you. The Thank gentleman you. from Tennessee yields back. The general lady, the gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank the, the panelists, uh, Mr. Horowitz, Ms. Lerner, Mr. Fine, for your wonderful work. Uh, I, I'll just associate myself with uh, the glowing remarks of uh, the gentleman from Tennessee uh, with regards to our appreciation for the work that you do and the work that your people do. Uh, it's extremely important and, and, and as important now it is as it's ever been, I think, on behalf of our country. Uh, I do want to acknowledge uh, the, uh, the return of our ranking member, appreciate. Uh, he has maintained uh, constant contact with the committee, so he's never really been out of the seat, but uh, good to see him physically uh, back in the chair this morning. Uh, I want to follow up on uh, Mr. Russell's line of questioning, especially regarding the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, so Special Inspector General John Sopko uh, has been concerned about the, the new practice in the Trump administration of classifying information that has been publicly available, uh, let's see, going back to 2003 at least. Uh, so um, there's a, he has raised it in his report. Uh, he has said, uh, among other things, that, uh, that data that was originally reported uh, publicly with regard to the uh, Afghan National Defense Force uh, capability assessments, uh, their attrition rates, how many people we got uh, uh, within the units that are being paid uh, uh, within Afghanistan, uh, casualty counts, uh, operational readiness, actual and authorized fig uh, 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 figures on, on uh, the number of personnel. He talks here about, uh, for the first time, uh, the reports are now classified with respect to information about the specific security goals of Afghanistan outlined in the Trump administration's new South Asia strategy, information about the increase in U.S. and coalition airstrikes in Afghanistan since mid-2017. Uh, he goes on and on. Those are, those are the, that, that's, that's the data. Those are the data that, that we rely on in making our decisions, and I, I know that uh, that's very important to you as well. On top of that, on top of classifying the information, and I can still get it, I can go down to the SCIF uh, and, I, and I can request uh, uh, access to the information. It just makes it more difficult for me to get it, and a lot of members, because they're so busy, they, they don't get to do all that. But uh, what troubles me additionally is that now the Department of Defense is denying that they've got blackout dates, so members of Congress cannot go. So, for instance, uh, beginning in June and lasting until September, we cannot go into Iraq. This is the Oversight Committee. We can't go to Iraq. Beginning in June and continuing indefinitely, we cannot go to Afghanistan. So what the administration is doing is pulling down the curtain. and. Uh, this committee has a natural affinity with the, our, our Inspector General community. Uh, on my CODELs, it was not unusual for me to, to take Stuart Bowen or his staff, Mr. Fitzgerald, first couple of CODELs into Sauter City, where we're spending billions of dollars on a sewage treatment facility and no one was looking to see whether they're actually building it. Or We had some satellite stuff, but you really couldn't see what was going on. But it wasn't until I actually got uh, the commanding general of that battle space to take us all in in an MRAP and, and uh, we were able to look at that to see that the work was actually being done. So we're spending all this money in Afghanistan and in Iraq, but especially Afghanistan. And there's, there's no oversight going on. Uh, I know SOPCO is being denied 
well, it's tough to operate in, in Afghanistan anyway. Uh, you have to rely on, on uh, you know, locals for some of the oversight. So, I mean, this is a, this is a shutdown of, of a lot of information that the American public used to have. And it is uh, the, the totality of what the Trump administration is doing here is denying information to the American people, denying it to, to Congress, uh, putting obstructions in the way of, of our Special Inspector General in, in Afghanistan on giving that information to the public. Uh, I just, you know, I just ask you to speak out um, about this trend. I'm very, very concerned about it. And, uh, you know, we're relying on each other to make sure that the best interests of the American people are protected, and especially our, our, our military who are in harm's way in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I just, uh, I just ask you to keep doing your jobs and, 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 and let us know if there are additional ways that we can put the pressure on to make sure that your folks are protected and, and, uh, and are able to perform the jobs that we've asked them to do. Thank you. The gentleman from Massachusetts yields back. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Meadows, are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your leadership in holding this hearing. Uh, thank you all for your work. Uh, as most of you know, I'm a big fan of the IG and uh, uh, of all of your work. And, and yet, I guess this is what, the 40th anniversary of, uh, of uh, your authorization, but also the 40th anniversary of civil service uh, uh, initiatives that, quite frankly, sometimes hamper and hurt uh, your ability to get jobs done and, and get things done. So I guess uh, what I'd love to hear uh, from each one of you very briefly is how do we fix this? I mean, the ability to hire, fire, and retain uh, continues to be uh, in the headlines each and every day, and sometimes even when we terminate, as Mr. Horowitz probably knows better than most, uh, it, it creates unbelievable headlines when honestly dealing with the whole retention and proper, uh, uh, I guess, proper remedial a uh, actions on behalf of government employees would be better if it's done in a different fashion. How, how do we fix this? Uh, and I know that's a one-hour question that you have one minute to respond to. But Mr. Horowitz, if you could start. It's a very challenging issue for IGs. It's a challenging issue for us ourselves to get our people on board. Um, security clearances, you add at an organization like DOJ. Um, if there are misconduct findings, getting people to take them uh, seriously, move them forward in a prompt way like we think they should so that people are held accountable. Um, I think there needs to be a bringing together of the stakeholders to, because I think everybody recognizes there's this problem on the front end and the back end, and in between, frankly, the ratings, the reviews, my, the, the, the strongest performers, we need to find a better way of acknowledging strong performance and rewarding strong performance. Um, I think it it's largely requires Congress coming together with the executive branch and doing that. So, Ms. Lerner, let me uh, ask you maybe a different uh, version of that. You know, Mr. Horowitz saying we need to talk and we need to get together. Um, you know, one thing that we're not short of here in uh, D.C. in the Beltway is talk uh, without action. And I guess my question to you is, is who would be the key players to make sure that we don't just talk about it uh, because I think all of you, all three of you, want to actually do something about that. So how do we make sure that Congress uh, actually is hand in glove with the executive branch on how we actually do this? I think back on something Earl Devaney said when the Recovery Act was going on. Is when, when you want to see things happen, you know, give people responsibilities and deadlines in a statute. And uh, you know you need to give people enough time for for um, good thoughts to percolate and be 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 shared and shaped and formed. But you know they can't have forever in, in, in which to do that. So a hard and fast deadline is vital. 
And, um, but I, I do think making sure that we, sh we, we remember all the things that drove the creation of these protections in the first place, and we don't throw the baby out with bathwater, because when I hear that we need to protect whistleblowers, we want to make sure that um, career employees have protections so that they're able to perform in the nonpartisan you know, fashion that they're supposed to do without fearing that they could uh, you know, be, lose their jobs because agency leadership doesn't agree with what they're saying. All right, well, you're at the one group that actually protects whistleblowers and actually supports the IG, so maybe this is the, the key component. Inspector General, fine, I'll let you close it out. Yeah, if I could add one thing, I do think it is very important for people to be held accountable when they've committed misconduct and to be cleared when they haven't and to, that to be done in a timely way. That's what IGs strive to do. One of the key things for us is to ensure that we have adequate budgets and staff to do that because that does affect timeliness. And uh, there are some IGs who have not received the sufficient budget to deal with the burgeoning caseload so that things get elongated and things stagnate and that's not good for anybody. It's not good for the, the person who has not committed the misconduct and it's not good for the agency if someone has committed misconduct. So we need to strive for timeliness but in order to do that there needs to be sort of significant budgets. It's a small amount. The return on investment is huge, both in terms of recoveries to the Treasury, but and also in terms of importance of holding people accountable. So I would, you know, uh, ask that there be focus and consistent, um, adequate budgets for the oversight. Well, if you could do that, then as part of your group, if you could actually get to this committee, and I would ask you maybe in the next 45 days to get to this committee, those areas that you feel like are most underappropriated as it relates to IG, some of, some of those are in better uh, shape than others, and I thank you all for your testimony. I'll yield back. The gentleman from North Carolina yields back. The gentleman from California is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Thank you to the ranking member for this meeting and to, we'll just act like, I always wanted to be on 60 Minutes. I wanted to be asking questions. So since the CBS cameras here, act like we're on 60 Minutes. Um, so I really wanted, first of all, to tell you how important in my view your jobs are, three of the most important positions in the, in the U.S. government and the integrity part, Mr. Fine, I think is important. So I wanted to focus on you. Um, in the last a year or so ago, we had the Defense Business Board here and sat where you're sitting. Um, one of the members who was a longtime member sat and answered a question to me where he said, uh, he was quite demonstrative about, you really can't give the department more money until you get this fixed. Um, and this was when um, they had a report, an um, audit from McKinsey that estimated there was $125 billion worth of waste. Uh, and it appeared that that report was uh, attempted to be held back from somebody in the department and then um, someone gave it to the Washington Post. So I wanted to ask you about that report. I also, this concern I have that I, I, uh, President Eisenhower's warning in his farewell address about the military industrial complex, giving the importance and the size of your jurisdiction and the audit, um, if you could respond to the Defense Business Board, and I've had multiple conversations with their members, their former chair, Bobby Stein, and their concern about, um, this is the business community that's been looking at the Department of Defense since, I believe, the Nixon administration. So if you could talk about their report, their role, and then secondarily, the audit. Um, and you mentioned the importance of the audit. And give us a timeline as to the expectation, understanding the challenges, because the department's never had a full audit, um, and your role in making sure that audit is done in a timely fashion. And I would imagine this financial audit will set up, hopefully, uh, a more extensive look at management audits and outcomes. And lastly, you mentioned uh, fifth on your list, financial management, eighth, ethical conduct, tenth, efficiencies, and then you mentioned uh, weapons development that be on time and on budget and the performance management of that. So if you could address those sort of three areas. So I'm uh, familiar with the report there. It is clear that there is areas of waste and areas for greater efficiencies in the Department of Defense with the enormous budget it has. It has a $700 billion budget. It has $2.4 trillion in assets. That's a huge amount. And there is areas for uh, efficiencies. The Department is looking to do that. One of the areas they need to do is to have a look at the duplicative efforts they have in the various services to do the same thing and whether there can be efficiencies and and garnered from that, and they are on, in the process of doing that, and it is important that they do that. Do we need all those separate entities doing the same thing? 
The key th a key thing is the financial statement audit that, that you referred to. It is very important. It is important for a variety of reasons. It's going to take a lot. It's probably the largest financial statement audit in history. There are probably over 1,000 auditors that are going to do over 25 separate audits of various parts of the Department of Defense. It's the first time the Department of Defense is under full audit. It is highly unlikely they are going to get a clean or unmodified opinion. The opinion is really not the most important thing right now. In my view, and also in the controller's view, and also the leaders of the department, the most important thing is to identify the deficiencies, have us give notices of findings and recommendations, and ensure that there is corrective action taken. The department is on board with that. They have visibility over all the findings that are coming in. There are different independent public accounting firms who have been hired to conduct the audit along with us. We provide oversight over those independent public accounting firms, and we are the group auditor and will roll up the opinions in the separate report into an overall opinion. And the opinion will be issued in November 15th. Now, it may be a disclaimer of opinion. I'd be surprised if it was an unmodified opinion. They'll get what they deserve. But it is very important that they keep doing this and that there's a sustained effort. Because Why is it important? Because it helps the Department manage its money, number one. It gives Congress and the American taxpayer more accurate information about how their money is spent. It benchmarks things so it, you can look and see whether there are cost overruns. And it's uh, useful in determining where there is waste, fraud, and abuse. It's useful in determining where the financial systems are uh, insecure and there are IT issues with them. It's very important in determining where the property is of the department. By property, I mean, for example, equipment, spare parts, munitions, so they don't order too much and just have it wasting in a warehouse, or they don't have enough of what they really need somewhere else, so they need to know what they have and where they have it. And the financial statement audit will help with that. Can, I'm going to interrupt you because sure. I only have 20 seconds, and I had hoped to give time back to my friend from Alabama, but that's not going to happen. Um, just on the procurement, your quote about the procurement, making sure that the, all these very sophisticated investments in new technologies done in a way that's above board and ethical and gets the best cost benefit for the American taxpayer. It is important. Procurement is a challenge. There are. Uh, uh, Numerous weapon systems. It is important that they, the department modernize and ensure that they do it in an effective way to get the systems on board in a timely way so they can be used, but not to do it in a wasteful way. It's an enormous challenge. I think the department is focused on that, and it needs to continue. To do Thank so. you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from California yields back. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized, Mr. Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the Inspector General community and all the different work that you do, even your recommended savings of potentially up to 98, almost $99 billion. Uh, and we join your community in calling for accountable and effective government. <clears throat> Recently, I introduced the Good Accounting Obligation and Government Act. Uh, this legislation would save taxpayer money and bring needed accountability to the federal agencies by requiring them to report on the status of the GAO and IG recommendations in their annual budget justification. Uh, the GAO IG is a House comp companion to Senator Young of Indiana and Senator Warren of Massachusetts' efforts in the Senate. We want to continue to move that. To Mrs. Lerner, does your office currently work with agencies to ensure recommendations are implemented and closed within a reasonable time frame? Yes, we do. Thank you. What is the average time period it takes an agency to close uh, new recommendations once they are issued? I don't know that we have that information. It probably varies from agency to agency fairly substantially. Okay. Uh, can, you, can you unpack that a little bit as far as why it would vary from agency to agency? In the complexity of the cases, the complexity of the agency, uh, the, the type of audit that you're talking about. Um, all of Thank those you. could contribute to it. One of the things we've been doing over, for about three or four years now is posting every six months the status of our uh, the, the, of the open recommendations chronologically, so the taxpayers, the public can see and Congress can see um, the oldest recommendations, the newer sure. recommendations. From our standpoint, we would expect an agency to, depending on complexity, uh, close the recommendation within certainly two to three years. And last question on this. Do you think the GAO IG Act uh, possibly, I don't know how familiar we are with it, uh, could help ensure timely implementation of new and old unimplemented recommendations? Okay. Congressman, I, um, I believe it's important to focus attention on open recommendations. We do the same thing, issue a compendium of open recommendations. There's 1,500 of them or 1,200 of them in the last 10 years. Some of them are very old. I think anything that provides transparency and sunshine is important. I believe in what Justice Brandeis said. Sunshine is the best disinfectant, and that is important in terms of follow-up of recommendations as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from Alabama. 
Well, thank the gentleman. Um, going back to the contract issue, Ms. Lerner, you, in your testimony, uh, you cite $500 billion in FY17 and $700 billion in FY18. Uh, is, that sum, uh, is that the sum of contract values, or does that include change orders? Uh, I think the, the $700 million Would you turn on your microphone? My big, sorry. I'll get this eventually. I think the $700 billion figure in my testimony was on grants. The $500 billion figure was on, Contract. on contracts. Okay. So uh, they're usually relatively close to each other with grants, you know, tipping, tipping a bit on an annual basis. My, what I'm trying to get to is this committee has looked into um, issues where we've had substantial overruns and contracts, particularly with embassies. And um, uh, one of the problems I think we have in this true Department of Defense is how we appropriate money for certain projects, and, and there's pressure felt by uh, the various agencies, including the Department of Defense, to start something before the contract is, the design is ready, and consequently we run into major overruns. It's something that I'm uh, trying to develop a, a remedy for that I'd like to talk to you later. You know, I, in the final minute or 20 seconds, that that the gentleman has yielded to me. You've all testified that there are agencies that do not comply with directives or recommendations, nor do they produce the requested progress or action reports. Uh, and this is for all three of you. What needs to be done to motivate agencies to comply? Um, from my standpoint, um, I think being transparent, letting the Congress, the public know, one of the things, um, as I mentioned, I implemented was posting them publicly. The first time we did that drill, we had 800 plus open recommendations. I told the Attorney General, the Deputy Attorney General was going to do that. They immediately sent out all the open recommendations to all the components, and our phones were ringing off the hook from the component heads who wanted to close their recommendations before they went public. I agree completely with IG Fine. The sunlight here is the key to that and ha holding people accountable to make sure these get done. We have to do that. That's one of the, uh, one of the tools in our toolkit. I agree with that, and, and we, when we issued our compendium, it got the attention of the department leaders. They've taken it very seriously. The Secretary of Defense has asked people, where are you on these recommendations? The tone gets set at the top. Sunshine is, I believe, the best disinfectant. One thing you could consider is having a hearing on open recommendations. These hearings matter, and people focus attention on it when, when, they're, when they have to. Well, my concern is, is that some of the stuff is carried over so long, particularly on improper payments. The amount keeps going up. and. Uh, uh, my staff and I are looking for ways to motivate, encourage, uh, uh, figure out some way to reduce those payments and, and encourage more compliance, and particularly with the IG's recommendations. And, and if I could add on your point on contracts, I think one of the things that struck us as we did this report, and we talk about this in the report, is on contract management and oversight within the agencies. We, our staffs, we get our budgets generally are 0.3% <coughs> of the agency's budget. They're a, a very small number. The real effective day-to-day -day oversight has to happen by management. It has to happen in the agency. And what I think we've talked about that surprised many of us is the same problem we were seeing over and over again in contract management, which is not enough people to do it. It's viewed as a collateral duty often. We've had examples, we've put out reports where the department's putting components are buying fuel and they're paying the invoice before knowing whether the fuel's there. Now, we've checked, and actually the goods were there. But that's so basic, you would expect that to be understood. And the problem that we hear is, and we're not really in a position to know if it's true or not, is, well, I'm managing dozens and dozens of contracts. I can't get out to look at the contract prison regularly or the other facility that we're using. And that's something I think we all need to think about, whether we're doing all these contracts and contracting and grants without getting the infrastructure to manage the additional monies that are going out the door, to your point. The same thing happens at my agency. Microphone. Microphone. The same thing happens at my agency with grants. You know, there, there, are, there are far too many grants that one person has to see, and they just can't add the value that the American taxpaying public needs. I thank the gentleman from North Carolina and, for, and the chairman for their indulgence. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. A gentleman from Maryland recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I know you were asked some questions about the ethics 
compliance and integrity within the agencies before. I wanted to just come back to that a little bit because we're really putting a focus on what kind of reforms might be appropriate, what kinds of things that may be operated as guidelines or um, norms but not actually put into statute or regulation where it might be appropriate to take that next step. So um, maybe you could speak a little bit more. I'm interested, I know there's been some attention drawn to some of the ethical lapses of, of senior officials within some of these agencies, and obviously that's a, a major concern for us here because that kind of, the culture of integrity and adherence to ethical norms and standards obviously begins at the top. Um, but I was curious if you could speak a little bit more to how, how um, you see the, the ethical um, uh, blindness or some of these issues, how that actually does flow down through an agency, and also um, how that information comes to you. Are there surveys that surface the employees' concerns about this? Is it more anecdotal? Is it your perception that when there's ethical lapses, it forces employees into a very difficult position because they are having to, um, in a sense, defend or protect supervisors or officials up the chain even though um, they don't necessarily agree with that, and it puts them in a kind of untenable position. What are, what are some of the elements by, by which the culture is damaged in an agency based on ethical lapses and, and, and morale suffers? I'm, I'm interested in getting a little more granular on that. I invite anybody on the panel to respond. <clears throat> so uh, the, <clears throat> I'll try to unpack that question because there's a lot in there, but I do agree that the tone gets set from the top and it's very important for the ethical uh, culture to be set from the top um, and to make clear what is acceptable and what is not, and then when there it is not to hold people accountable in a timely way. I'm fortunate the sec in the Department of Defense, Secretary of Defense takes that very seriously and has done that regularly and publicly, and that's important to the, to the conduct. We also look at trends, and the trends are actually pretty good in the Department of Defense in terms of substantiated misconduct. It's gone down. That doesn't mean any misconduct is acceptable, but it is going in the right direction. There does need to be education, and we need to have a role in providing proactive education to people about what they can't do, what they shouldn't do, how they should deal with things, and what's going to happen if they do it. So that's very important. It's also very important to operate uh, effective hotlines. We have hotlines where we get anonymous complaints that people can take, uh, can expose to us in an anonymous way or in a, in a uh, or saying their names. Uh, and either way, we need to take it seriously. We get a lot of them. We get about 13,000 a year. Many of them are just frivolous or just can be dismissed immediately or the wrong agency, but some of them are serious, and that is an important way. And ultimately, it's important that uh, people be clear that there will be consequences for misconduct, and we play an important role in that, as does the agency taking action on our reports in a timely way. I think one of the things that uh, <clears throat> has changed and has been an important change is the IG is posting public summaries of misconduct findings by employees at the GS-15 and above level. Some of us were doing that before Congress passed the IG Empowerment Act, but we're now all required to do that. I can tell you from our standpoint, when we started posting those summaries, back to the point of sunlight being the best disinfectant, um, we started seeing much quicker action, much quicker responses by the department in responding to those findings. Whereas before it could take months or years, the department quickly understood that they would be getting inquiries, whether it was from members of Congress, whether it was from the public, um, whether it was from the press, about our findings and whether they had taken action. And so that's been important. But I think that is one of the consistent frustrations among the IG community, what IG Fine said, is there needs to be timely response to misconduct, certainly at the highest levels, but frankly at all levels. Um, if you talk to folks about culture, a lot of people will say mid-level management is equally important, if not more important at some level, because those are the people who touch everybody. 
Um, very important for tone to be set at the top, but mid-level managers need to walk the walk on those issues. And um, we are seeing improvement in the timeliness of taking action, but that's something that I think the committee could consider how we make sure that people are held accountable, prompt and timely way, uh, justice delayed is justice denied at, at, at all levels. Thanks very much. Yield back. The gentleman from Maryland yields back. The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I want to follow up on, on the question that's just being asked, so, because if you cut to the chase, fairly uniformly and fairly consistently, your recommendations are ignored. Um, what can be done to, to change that? I mean, part of it's what you were just getting at. Are there other things that could be done so that your findings are not ignored as they are? I mean, I think it's amazing to think that they're, in essence, $100 billion worth of savings that are floating around out there, and that there are indeed 39,000 recommendations on your site, and yet you don't see all that much action relative to the amount of data that you have out there suggesting change is needed. A um, couple things I'll pick up on that um, have been mentioned that I think are important, and, and others, um, I think it's important that we as IGs make our known to the public and they're transparent. I think it's very important for Congress to do follow-up as well as the IGs. We consistently do follow-up, but we're not management. And we can't, other than continuing to issue reports, continuing to uh, uh, make public what we're finding, we're not management, we're not ultimately the ones who are gonna implement it. The other thing we did, and I met with Director Mulvaney when he first came on board. Um, he asked us to put together a list of um, some of the bigger outstanding uh, recommendations. We've done that, and I think OMB can also play a role through the budget process. Uh, if you were to pick the single, each one of you were to pick the single most glaring example of waste in your view, it'd be what? Waste or inefficiency or something that should be changed? Um, I can speak to um, the DOJ uh, recommendations. I'll give me an example. A couple of years ago, we issued a report where we found that just shorter because yeah. I've only got three. Your years. prisons was paying multiples of the Medicare rate for health care, and it's not capped like other, like the Department of Defense and others. So you'd say your million, prison hundred million dollars. Okay, Ms. Lerner, you'd say what? We've issued many recommendations. Just issued one. Many just recommendations one. Just related one. to. Um, uh, large facility construction at NSF, and they've actually finally taken significant action to put policies and procedures in place to make that better as a result of our work. Something more concrete. And while you're thinking on it, okay. uh, Mr. Fine. There's so much in the department. Yeah. There are so much in the Department of Defense, but you're asking for one, and I would just say duplicative um, lines of effort. They're, they're all doing similar things. I, I, I know, but that's so nebulous. Uh, health care. Why do we have separate health care systems? Why do we have separate PXs for different services? Why do we have separate, I don't even know, uh, suspension and debarment offers? Why can't we have more centralized services in the Department of Defense rather than have each one of them have their own PX, MX, health care clinic, things like that? Ms. Lerner, are you about to say? You know, I'm, I'm, I, in, we, we've made so much progress with the agency, I don't really have a glaring problem right now. Hmm. I have some minor issues, but we are, we are in a pretty decent place. So the National Science Foundation is government nirvana when it comes to waste, fraud, or abuse. I would not say abuse. that, but, okay. but we, right. we've, we are, we are, if you'd asked me this question two years ago, I'd have had an entirely different answer okay. for you. Quick question. Uh, given you know, the charges of Russians, given Facebook, it just seems that, that uh, uh, the internet, um, um, social media, and data is in the news. Um, if in reading through some of your stuff, there have been any number of different threats in terms of data. Uh, you look at some of the big breaches over the years. Um, are, are there is there anything that jumps out at you from the standpoint of making the data systems that we have at the governmental level within your respective areas uh, tighter and and more secure? Absolutely. We've issued reports on that. For example, in the NSA, which has had you know, data breaches, particularly from insiders, that they do not have adequate controls on that in terms of the privileged users, in terms of enclaves, in terms of all sorts of things, that they need to <clears throat> tighten up their systems. Do you think culture is right there? or It's a systems question or a culture question? I think it's both. I think, I think, I think it's a combination of, of, of both. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have got one more question I just wanted to get to, <clears> which was, 
uh, I, I noticed deferred maintenance is, is showing up something um, in a couple of different reports. Um, you know, barn from Peter to pay for Paul seems to be the way of government. Um, is there something that you think systematically might address that, whether that's a capital account versus an operating account? Or is there something that could be more concrete so that you don't see the level of deferred maintenance that Joel's reports seem to suggest exist? Let me say, I think uh, from our standpoint, we've seen it in the prison system, aging prisons. And what happens is there's such a focus on finding either new bed space or other places and thinking new as opposed to fixing what's old. It just, I, I think it's a priority and a, and a management issue at a certain level, a culture issue, that people aren't focused on maintaining what they have. They're getting funding and they're thinking about building new. Mr. Chairman, I see I burned through my time. Thank you, sir. General from South Carolina yields back. The chair will now uh, recognize the gentlelady from New York. I thank uh, Chairman Gowdy for yielding, and I, it's such a great pleasure to see our ranking member uh, strongly here fighting for the people. Uh, we welcome you back to your good post in office for the people. And I want to really thank very much uh, the IGs for the role that you are not only playing today, but that you play every day in trying to maintain the trust of the public in, in the integrity of our government. And if our government doesn't have trust, and that's a big part of your job, then uh, the people won't follow it. So I, I think your role is one of the most important in government, and I want to thank you for it. Um, and I think working together, if we work together, we're going to be stronger in our oversight. And I welcome the opportunity when more comes out from your reports to try to implement them into uh, positive action for change to, to make government uh, work better for the taxpayers and for everybody. I, I, I want to compliment the chairman for having a hearing on the census. I believe it's May 6th coming up, right, May 6th. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but I would like to place in the record several letters that I've written to, chair, to the, the Secretary Ross requesting information about controversial items in it and uh, for which I have received no response and hoping that at the May 6th uh, hearing, May, excuse me, May 8th hearing, that the information will be provided uh, so we can discuss it. At, at issue is something that is critical. The, the census is the only, only document that is required of the executive branch in the, in the in the Constitution, it is the largest uh, peacetime undertaking that this country does, and it becomes the, the focus of all of the research for what we do as a country. It's critical. The private sector cares just as much about it as the, as the public sector for our planning, and it is the basis of the distribution of over $700 billion yearly in federal funding for health care, transportation, everything else, and, and also the basis of representation. Our representation numbers on the city, state, and federal level are based on census, and they ask for everyone to be counted. And at issue is this question that they added at the last minute, uh, asking about citizenship, when the studies of the census had showed, and by outside groups, that it decreases participation, so therefore would lead to an inaccurate census and, and possibly more monies that have to be spent on it. So I, I just wanted to ask if the if the questions could be answered for the hearing. And also, uh, along with the chairman, I, a rather ranking member, I have put in a bill called the IDEA Act that you wouldn't do last minute changes without studying what the impact would be on public policy. So I just wanted to put that in as, as a, a request for the May 8th hearing coming up that we're, our oversight will be stronger. Uh, I, I'm, I'm interested, a lot of you have talked about inefficiencies and we, we need to get IT into all of our agencies and we need to coordinate it and we need to make it work and it's not working. And if we can put a man on the moon, we can figure out how to get good IT into all of our agencies. And, and uh, that's one of the areas that you uh, called uh, and talked about as being an, an important area we need to look at. And, uh, uh, I think one of you, your, your report said, and I quote, if, that, our, that our IT is outdated, obsolete. Uh, it, you're pretty damning about our IT. And uh, I want to know uh, 
Uh, you, in, in your your testimony, Mr. Fine, you stated that DOD is quote operating with many decentralized and non-compliant information technology systems. So I would, uh, you know, how, wh why are we putting money into things that are decentralized? We should try to decent to centralize for our procurement, for our sharing of information, and everything else. And and yet I read that we have a big budget for this. We have a, a bigger budget than most countries in the world. So why can't we get there? Why can't we get our act together, basically? And, and what can we do to conduct more rigorous oversight, working together? Congress would like to be part of a partner with you on seeing if we can get our IT systems working in a better way. I mean, I, I think we have an example of where technology has far outpaced our ability to keep up with it. Uh, Mr. Fine. Yes, I, th that comment had to do with the multitude of f financial feeder systems that feed into the main system, and many of them are obsolete, they're old. It's part of the problem is uh, each entity, each defense agency, each service wants its own system, wants to customize its system, is wedded to that system, and resists going to a centralized system. The department is moving towards that to their credit. Uh, it's going to take a while. Uh, IT systems are very difficult, very challenging. You need adequate staff to do that, and even hiring, retaining, and growing adequate IT staff within the agency, certainly in the Department of Defense and others, is a challenge, particularly given the salaries the government pays versus what they can get elsewhere. So that is a tremendous challenge. And if you're not moving forward every day, you're going to move backward. You're going to be way behind. IT changes so mm -hmm. quickly that this mm -hmm. does have to be a focus. I know the Department of Defense is focused on that, but they need to move forward with it, and they're trying to do that. Uh, would, would I, I wish you would, uh, my time's expired, but if you could get to the chairman some ideas of in writing of how we could maybe work, it, it seems silly to build an IT system that's not centralized given uh, in payment and everything else and information sharing. You know, we have all these lists about bad, bad contractors, don't, don't hire this contractor, but how do people access them? You know, it should, any ideas that you have to make that system uh, work better, I think that's something that we in a bipartisan uh, way would welcome. My time's expired, would, way, way over. Thank it, you. Mr. Chairman, if I could just add one thing. Sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I would say to my friend from New York, Mr. Fine's testimony notwithstanding, it is important to note this committee has the scorecard on Fatara and the Pentagon got an F. So in terms of progress, this committee has yet to see it uh, as, as measured by metrics set by the GAO and this committee in terms of implementation of the information technology modernization. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. Um, I prefer to go last, and um, we've got a great issue today, which is we've had wonderful member participation on both sides. So um, I'm going to get the gentleman from Alabama to uh, close out the hearing, but I'm going to ask my questions now, and with apologies to my friend from Wisconsin and, and Iowa. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. I, I have not yet had a chance to ask questions. I was not going to exclude you either. <laughs> <laughs> well, you will go right in between. Uh, all right, right in between the two R's. I'll try to be brief. Thank you, uh, Inspector General Horowitz. The uh, 2008 reform. Uh, why was it necessary, and um, and and what progress has been made as a result of the 2008 reforms? Well, the importance of the 2008 reforms was creating the Council of the Inspectors General to bring together the 73 IGs to look at issues that transcend the federal government so that we're not just only running in our own lanes, but we're thinking across IGs. And it, in the 10 years we've been in existence, has helped, I think immeasurably, IGs think broader than just our own agencies and our own oversight. Whether it's the cross-cutting reviews we've done about IT issues, uh, we're working now on a Native American review, a lot of agencies touch that, um, it's, and we've put together oversight.gov to put in one place all the reports so that the public, members of Congress, the executive branch can see our work across the 73 IGs. I want to ask you a two-part question. Um, assuming um, no additional funding, what reform could be implemented with respect to your jurisdiction that would show, um, that show progress? So I'm not going to give you any money, but I'm going to give you um, free reign to make any reform that you want with respect to your oversight of the department. Well, I think the biggest ask we've had um, for several years now during the IG Empowerment Act was the ability to issue testimonial subpoenas. 
um, which obviously is a no-cost issue, an important issue we've identified, we've worked with this committee on, you've reported out a bill. I would note that Mr. Fine and DOD uh, IG has that authority, um, and that's what we're looking for. All right, now I'm going to give you whatever amount of money you want. What reform would you implement um, that would help you provide oversight if costs were not a consideration? I think there are a couple of things we've looked for on the IT side. We've looked to modernize our own systems and create more systems that will demonstrate transparency and give us uh, and the public and the Congress greater oversight on disaster assistance, uh, multi-billion dollars being sent out. We want to build a web page that shows the oversight work we've done. As we've talked about today in this hearing, putting forward our findings, particularly where there are failures, is much more likely to trigger reform than just keeping them in-house and the public not seeing them. So what we'd like to do is improve builduponoversight.gov and, and build a platform that would show open recommendations um, and allow those kind of issues to be seen more by the public and Congress. From time to time, I'm a slow learner, and I know you've explained this to me before, but I want to give you a chance <clears throat> to do it again. The interplay between your agency and the Office of Professional Responsibility within the Department of Justice. So um, we are the only IG office of the 73 Federal Inspectors General that does not have the authority to investigate misconduct by all employees in our agency. The exclusion that Congress put in place in the IG Act is for misconduct by lawyers in the department, including prosecutors, when they create, when they engage in misconduct, ethical violations in the courtroom. We have asked for that authority for the 30 years since we were created in 1988. Mr. Fine, when he was IG, spent 11 years arguing for that authority. His predecessors did as well. We think independent oversight matters. St having a statutorily independent IG do that, rather than having an organization that's overseen by the department's leadership. It's long overdue. It's something that should be done. Well, in my remaining time, I'm just going to make an observation. It seems like a, a tough political environment we find ourselves in. It's frankly been that way the whole time I've been in Congress. So increasingly, folks are looking to you as kind of that neutral, detached arbiter to kind of separate out what facts are relevant, what's not, and what conclusions we should draw from those facts. But you're only as good as your access to information and witnesses. Um, your experience with, with the department um, the whole time, crossing um, three AGs um, and two administrations, are you getting access to the, to the physical evidence, the documents, and the witnesses that you think you need to be able to do your job in a way that is confidence-inspiring for the public? Um, thanks to the help of the committee and passing the IG Empowerment Act and all of the hearings you held, um, we are getting access to records, the records we need, the documents we need, um, and we have the ability to subpoena third parties if we need records. To, on testimony, if an employee is in the Department of Justice, we have the ability to compel their testimony under the IG Act. That's fine. The issue remains third parties, um, and we often get voluntary cooperation with us, but if individuals don't speak to us voluntarily, if there isn't the ability to work with a prosecutor, to issue a grand jury subpoena, uh, we have no ability to reach those individuals. Even if they have highly relevant evidence, in a whistleblower case, they might have retired. Um, in other misconduct cases, we can't get that evidence. Well, I appreciate the work of all uh, three of you and all the inspectors general. Um, I think the public really does view you all as the neutral detached umpires that you would want um, doing this work. With that, the gentleman from Virginia is recognized. I thank the chair. And building a little bit on what the chair was just asking, Mr. Horowitz, uh, you know, you want transparency, you want cooperation. Surely that would also apply to the IGs themselves, would it not? Yes. Because in order to have faith in your work, and this committee certainly puts great faith in your work collectively, um, you have to be unassailable, you collectively. Correct. If there's a taint or a tarnish or questions of ethics or methodology, uh, that could damage the entire uh, credibility of a report or an investigation undertaken by any and all IGs. Is that a fair statement? It is. So what is the process for looking at yourselves to make sure that those standards are adhered to and complaints are judiciously 
uh, and transparently uh, adjudicated? Um, so one of the reforms that occurred in 2008 with the new legislation, the amendment to the IG Act, was the creating of an integrity committee uh, that was at the time chaired by the FBI that had seven members at the time, uh, four of whom were IGs appointed by the chair of SIGI, um, and the FBI appointee chairing it, uh, representative from the Office of Government Ethics, and the Office of Special Counsel, the Special Counsel. Uh, that process was changed with the IG Impairment Act a year and a half ago um, because of concerns over uh, how it was being run and operated and handled. Um, and so Congress uh, changed the process. So now there is an IG chair of the committee. Instead of the FBI. Instead of the FBI. The FBI is still a member, but uh, they are, it's now a six member committee. The special counsel is no longer a member of the committee because of potential conflicts that arose when there were whistleblower issues that were within the special counsel's jurisdiction. They want to, uh, we wanted to make sure that that didn't occur. Um, and over the last year, we have been transitioning control over records from the FBI to the Council of IGs. The challenge being, because SIGI has no appropriation and had no systems or systems of records in place to control, collect those records, we had to go forward and follow, put for public comment, regulations, we, had a, we have to create a data system. Um, so we've been doing that over the last year. It's taken us some time, but frankly, we've asked for funding to help do that. We still don't have funding, so we're doing it through the volunteer uh, contributions of the membership. Something Congress obviously has to look at. Ms. Lerner, um, you have the title of Vice Chair of SIGI, is that correct? Yes, sir. And let me see, in fiscal year 2017, your committee, the Integrity Committee, received 59 allegations of IG misconduct. Is that correct? Um, I have. Take I it have, on faith. I, I don't. I, if, if you've read that from reporting from Siggy, I'm assuming that's All right. correct. Of those 59, 50 closed with no referral for investigation. Sound familiar? It does. Six were referred to another agency. And two, only two, were referred to the Integrity Committee for further investigation, two out of 59. Now, without knowing the particulars, and maybe some of them are frivolous, and maybe some of them are just, you know, payback, anyone can file a complaint, but just the raw numbers, and my own experience, frankly, with Siggy, would suggest that the robustness of the willingness to investigate one's own is lacking. I'm sorry that it appears that way. I can say as someone who served on the Integrity Committee that we looked at the allegations that came in really seriously. Um, I was on it several years ago, but um, we, t we took our responsibilities very, very seriously. Well, Ms. Lerner, I happen, to, I happen to be somebody who yeah. filed a complaint mm -hmm. along with a colleague on this committee. Two of us from this committee filed a complaint against a specific IG. And I can tell you the, the process was most unsatisfying. It and wasn't rigorous. There wasn't accountability. There was no explanation for the decision taken. There was no point-by-point -point response to a fairly carefully worded complaint that was rather lengthy. I That's a pretty unsatisfying process for somebody concerned about integrity. And I, think, I believe that that's one of the reasons that we have seen some of the changes that we are seeing now, that the frustrations that you felt and that some of us as members of the committee felt at that time led to the, 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 the shift from the, the committee from the FBI's responsibility to SIGI. And I know that there are other changes that have been made to try to respond to the type of frustration that you felt and, and that some of us that served on the committee felt well, to make it better. I invite you and your colleagues, and Mr. Horowitz and I have talked about this, but I am determined that we're going to codify the process. This committee, on a bipartisan basis, has to be assured as to the integrity of IGs as they do their work. They can't be compromised on partisan politics. They can't be compromised on any grounds. Um, because we want you to work. We want you to be successful. We want people automatically to assume that what you're saying is a truthful rendition, unbiased, of, uh, of where the truth took you. So look for legislation. Um, and, uh, you know, we could do it cooperatively or not, but, but we are not satisfied with the process based on our own experience, and I, I believe we're going to have to, 
you know, engage in some codification. I know my time is up, Mr. Chairman, but if you would allow Mr. Horwitz to comment, he seems eager to comment on this matter, and I will then yield back. I thank the Chair. Yeah, can I just uh, briefly, um, I certainly appreciate your concerns. We met shortly after I became Chair in 2015, and I think we've seen, we worked with Congress on reforms that were needed and put in place in the IG Empowerment Act. Um, certainly happy to work with you and other members of this committee on further reforms because we agree completely that you, the public in particular at large, needs to understand um, and people in our own agencies that we're being watched as well if there's something we did that was improper or incorrect. And in fact, one of the things we did and that the report is up here with the Congress is, is required by statute. We put in place twice revisions to the procedures and policies of the Integrity Committee to address some of the concerns that we spoke about. Um, and so I certainly take them seriously. I know IG Lerner takes them seriously from her service on the committee. I've never been on the committee. Um, and I think it's very important that we do the right thing by that and look forward to working with you on it. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grothman, for five minutes. Sure, a couple of questions. Um, first of all, the report in general identifies procurement planning as a challenge. Um, give us an example about how the lack of enterprise level procurement planning has impacted your agencies. Uh, I, th I think, that, for example, in the Department of Defense, there are many issues with procurement, including moving forward without having the requirements set. Often we have requirements from different parts of the Department of Defense and it's hard to adjust to them. The F-35 fighters are, for example, a big one and that has uh, created challenges and, and cost overruns and because of the differing requirements. So that there's a massive amount of money in it and we need to make sure it's effectively moved forward. Okay. General question. We talked before about waste, fraud and abuse. You know, that's a famous saying that's been around here probably when I was a child. Um, what, I guess I'll deal with each one separately. With regard to fraud, if there is genuine fraud, do you see a follow-up or consequences for the employees involved in that fraud? I would say it depends, frankly. It varies among the components in the department. Um, and one of the things we have worked hard to do in our OIG is uh, not only alert management of the components, law enforcement components, other components, when we've had concerns, but frankly report to the Deputy Attorney General and the Attorney General so that action is taken to reform the process. Uh, now, I'm just going to say reform the process. Fraud means criminal, right? Oh, oh I'm, I, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about the misconduct side of it. I agree. We right, have, right. We, we bring it to um, prosecutors because we don't have the authority to prosecute. And I will say from my standpoint, one of our frustrations has been some of what I'll call the smaller dollar frauds that may not meet threshold levels in U.S. Attorney's Office because they're busy uh, with so many other matters, um, making sure those get attention. That can be a challenge because I don't have, frankly, a, like a DOD perhaps, frauds that involve tens of millions of dollars. Um, nevertheless, these are government officials engaging in wrongdoing, theft, fraud. Those people need to be held accountable criminally if they've engaged in a crime. Okay, and kind of a follow-up, when accountable could be two things. Accountable could be at a minimum fired and then appropriately criminally. What do you think usually happens? Criminally fired or nothing at all? Um, again, I would say it depends. Um, it is a challenge for us to get um, the kind of cases we want taken criminally, criminally at times. Um, we, if there's outright fraud and criminal conduct, we do see the agencies taking action ultimately. Our concern is timeliness particularly for someone who's engaged in criminal activity, we think. Okay. I, I went, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Lerner. If I might something. add on that yeah. point, we've had some success. We have some of the same situations that Mr. Horowitz does with some of our cases being the dollar amounts being not sufficient to in, in interest pro federal prosecutors, but we've had great luck with some state and local prosecutions, and the agency, you know, has usually removed the person you know, even before those move forward. But we, we try, if we can't get it at the state, at the, you know, we'll, we'll talk to any prosecutor that has an appropriate violation that can work with us. Uh, and Mr. Fine, obviously we have a, 
we, we, are, we are again and again told that we have to spend more money on defense, and this budget, I think, contains a 10.5% spending increase, maybe a little more than I would have preferred. Um, but you read about stories about waste in, in the Department of Defense, and some of that's not criminal, but some is just amazing. Is there any consequences for people who come up with these amazing stories you, you talk about in the Department of Defense, or they just keep on with their same position or rank or whatever? Uh, it depends. It varies. Sometimes there are consequences, both in terms of not getting promoted, moved, moved out, um, not being viewed as effective. Sometimes there are not consequences and people continue on. It really does, it do, does depend on the circumstances and often it depends on the leader. Uh, and there are, anytime there is that amount of money, there is going to be inefficiencies, waste, and fraud, and, uh, and it, it varies across the board, and there, are, there ought to be uh, consequences for that. Right. I mean, I guess the question is, you know, when you hear about massive cost overruns or, or mm -hmm. things that shouldn't happen, does anybody pay a price for that, or they just hang around with perhaps the ability to do it again and again? Uh, like I say, it depends on the circumstances. It depends on what level it is. It depends who was responsible for it and why it happened. And sometimes it's judgments, and you know, that were, where mistakes were made, but sometimes things that are, are avoidable. And so I can't say there are never any consequences, but are there always consequences? No. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you all for being here today. It always makes a great day when I look at my committee schedule and I get to see the IGs here. So thanks. <laughs> the gentleman yields. The uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Blum, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Palmer. Thank you uh, to the panelists for being here today, and thank you to, for what you do in the IG community. It's very much appreciated. I think I'm the last questioner. So. Uh, that, that's good news. I'm from the private sector, and seldom does a day go by in the federal government that I don't shake my head. I view Congress as the board of directors of a very large enterprise doing trillions of dollars of business, and I see the IG community as our auditors. So I, I want your opinions on, on some of these questions, and I want to go to the 60,000-foot level if we could. First of all, is there accountability, in your opinion, in our agencies, in the federal government? From my perspective, in our agency, sometimes uh, it varies. Thank you for your honesty. Is there accountability? I think I would have to have to agree with my colleague, Mr. Horowitz. Sometimes. Department of Defense accountability. That's the, uh, that's the exact words I wrote down here. It varies. It does, sometimes there is, and sometimes there's not. In the second part, coming from the private sector of that question, I always would say uh, in my companies, as evidenced by what. So if there is accountability, as evidenced by what? Where I'm heading here is what percentage of uh, federal employees are terminated every year? What percentage of management is terminated every year? Because I have sat here and asked witnesses about $370 million of an IT project that was scrapped after four years. $370 million of taxpayers' money. And I asked, did anyone lose their job? And the answer was no. you got to be kidding me. So, I mean, what, what percent of our workforce in the federal government is terminated? I, I wouldn't know what percent of the, work, of the federal workforce. I, again, I could, we could speak anecdotally to what we've seen as IGs in our own agencies. Um, you know, okay, the give, give me that answer. Uh, is it enough? Um, people are not held accountable in a timely fashion sufficiently from my standpoint. And again, it varies. We've, I've been here a few times for hearings about... Yes some of the issues with DEA, uh, other parts of the department, uh, giving bonuses to people who engaged in wrongdoing, um, as you recall, a couple or of the years ago. Or the IRS ago. rehiring people that uh, on, the, on their, on their uh, job things says do not rehire. Right. What is that, what message does that send where you not only not take action against people, but you give them a reward, a bonus, an acknowledgement for the work they've done? Only here, only here in the federal government. Ms. Lerner, or Mr. Fine, anything? As far as termination percentages, well, no, I don't if you don't know, know the exact number, I mean, should I there be no, more? No, How do we hold people accountable? I don't know the exact number in the Department of Defense. What often happens, though, is if you're not promoted, you're out. And so sometimes this does have consequences for bad uh, evaluation reports, and then they do have to have to leave. But it does vary. It depends on, on the circumstances. Um, so um, I think you can't have one uh, general, general comment uh, about that. 
And let, 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 I only have two minutes left. Let, let, let's look at the positive side of this. And uh, I often talk about incentives. And there's incentives in the private sector to save money, for example, in a corporation. What, are there incentives in the federal government to save taxpayer money? Are there incentives to report? What's the incentive to report, report fraud? What's the uh, incentive to report abuse, waste, fraud, and abuse? What are the incentives, though? I think they're upside down in the federal government compared to the private sector. Maybe we need more incentives. Maybe there needs to be monetary incentives for people to save the taxpayers' money. I'd like to have your thoughts on that. Here's one incentive that's, that is different in the federal government that I ask you to consider. If an agency does its work and doesn't spend all its money, then the next year the money gets taken away and their budget is cut and they're not, they're not um, praised for performing their mission effectively with a lower budget. It is, oh, you really didn't need the money. And so there's an incentive to spend it all at the, at the end of the year. That's a disincentive. That's a perverse incentive, in my view. And, we ought, and, and that, that's an issue that I think you know, is important that, uh, that does differ a little bit from the, the private sector, where if you do the job without um, spending all the money, I, there's more praise than in the federal government. Can you imagine if our federal employees got a small percentage as a bonus mm -hmm. of the money they saved the American taxpayer? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine unleashing that across our federal agencies, how much waste we could reduce? Does that have merit? Does that idea have merit in the federal government, in your opinion? Anyone? Go ahead. Go ahead. Look, I think there's uh, one of the challenges we face is um, a inability to reward our strongest performers, um, other than we obviously have honor awards. Um, we give other recognition out. We are able to give some recognition each year in terms of bonuses, but our bonus pools, just as an example, are about 1.5% or less of salaries. Um, and compared to from my time in the law firm world, that's a pretty small mm -hmm. uh, comparable number in terms of bonus. And yeah, I, and my time is up, but I, I think we need to do a better job of holding people accountable and or terminating them. And we also need to do a better job of rewarding performers uh, with incentives. Uh, my time is up, but thank you so much for what the IG community does. I yield back. I thank the gentleman for that uh, excellent line of questions. Um, uh, I thank the witnesses for appearing before us today. I think this has been a constructive hearing, and I think um, I, I can speak for my colleagues that this is a, an, an area and these are issues that, that you will have bipartisan support in trying to address. Uh, it's a very important effort that needs to be undertaken. Uh, the hearing record will remain open for two weeks for any member to submit an opening statement or, or for questions for the record. Uh, if there's no further business without objection, the committee stands adjourned.